you, Lewis. We'll see whether you applaud at the end. <laughs> you didn't come here to hear about me, but to hear about the fertile universe. So I'm going to begin immediately, except I have to add a word. That when I hear these introductions, it's on, what are they talking about? <laughs> but I grew up, okay, among ten children. I'm one of ten. And my mother getting us all out to school in the morning, you know, the story is that sometimes I don't recognize myself. Well, there are times when my mother didn't recognize me. <laughs> you know, six, eight of us were getting to high school primary school and all at the same time I was picking up packing lunches. I come down the stairs and she'd look up and she'd say, Well, no mom, Richard, no mom. <laughs> Vincent, no mom. She had a German background. She'd say, Who the hell are you? <laughs> oh mom, I'm George. Oh George, I love you. I <laughs> Let's talk about um the fertile universe. This may sound like a fanciful kind of talk, the dance of the fertile universe, but I want you to know that it is a dance, and there are three little ballerinas who are dancing. Chance, destiny, and fertile universe. There are three essential ideas that I'd like to share with you. First of all, did the universe and all that we know in the universe come about by chance or by necessity? That's a big question. And we're going to try and address it from a scientific point of view. Did the universe and everything in it come about by chance or by necessity? Of course, I'm going to have to say something about what I mean by chance and necessity, but we'll do that. Mm -hmm. But the reason I ask that question as a scientist because it immediately introduces us to a further question, which is not a scientific question, but it's a very important question, at least it is to me. And I think to most people in society, whether you believe it or not, it's a very important question for all of us that live together. And that is the God question is buried in here, right? Because if it happened by pure chance, well, who needs God? It just happened. And that could be true. As a matter of fact, the best of science, science says it's not true, but it could be. So it's worth asking the question. If it happened by necessity, who necessitated it? Who did it? So as we go along, and I'll return to it at the end, the God question is buried in this kind of scientific question. Okay. Why is the universe fertile? If I stand in front of anyone so you can't see the screen, let me know. Because I tell my students, I may be a pain, but I'm not glass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the universe is fertile for two essential scientific results. The universe is 13.8 billion years old, plus or minus 0.2 billion. And we know that very accurately. That itself would make a series of lectures as how to come to that. But we know it. And for our purposes, we're going to assume we know it. And it contains 10,000 billion, billion stars. I repeat, billion, because I have to. I don't have other words to say this number. It's one with 22 zeros behind it, star. Let's build on that. From the time of the Big Bang, the universe has been expanding. It's getting bigger all the time. This is one little orange slice, so to speak, of the universe. Since the universe is 13.8 billion years old, we are here. Oh, I think that helped. Yeah, thanks. And then you don't even have to look at me. Since the universe is 13.8 billion years old, we are out here. The universe has been expanding for 13.8 billion years. And with big telescopes, the Hubble telescope and other big telescopes on the surface of the Earth, we are looking back as far as we can. And we've seen back now with big telescopes to about half a billion years after the Big Bang. 
that itself is quite an achievement. So let's look back and let's take a picture of the universe back then, and what do we see? Well, that's what we see. Why am I so excited? <laughs> They're only little dots of light. Every one of these dots, except for about four of them, that's a star, that's a star. Every one of these dots is a galaxy. Let's sample a few of them. There's an irregular galaxy that contains about half the number of stars in our galaxy. There's an elliptical galaxy that they contain as many as five times the number of stars in our galaxy. By the way, this is a little baby galaxy that it's eating up. That's why it got to be a big galaxy. We call it galactic cannibalism. And then down here is a galaxy like our own, a spiral galaxy, which contains about 200 billion stars, that one galaxy. So if we add up all of these galaxies, that's how we come to the number of 10,000 billion billion stars in the universe. Because what we do, this photograph here, was taken of a piece of the sky that's about 1 20th the thickness of my index finger. And the reason was we wanted to see deep into the universe so we didn't want to see nearby stuff. If I want to see the Empire State Building, I don't know what direction I'm looking, but it's assume it's there, I'm going to take a very narrow look so I don't see your heads. I want to see through you to the distant universe. So if this is one photograph of a piece of the sky that small, do the statistics around the sky, take pictures here and here and here and here to get good sampling, and that's how you come up with 10,000 billion billion stars. Here is a typical galaxy like our own. This is a sister galaxy to us. It's the Andromeda galaxy. And it contains, as I just said, about 200 billion stars, this one galaxy, and it measures 100,000 light years across from here to there. Now let's pause for a moment. 100,000 light years across. That means it takes light 100,000 years to go from one edge of this galaxy to the other. So let's imagine I'm down here and my mother-in-law is up there. <laughs> I don't have one, so I can't. So I say, Mom, how are you feeling today? Okay, 100,000 years later, well, 200,000 years later, she says, oh, I'm not feeling so well, you know. My knee is hurting, I'm not playing tennis anymore, I'm not really enjoying my gin and tonic, and now all this stuff. But well, that assumes that sound travels at the speed of light, but let's forget that. Let's, you, know, you get the idea. As we look out in space, we're looking back in time. When we saw those galaxies on that first photo, we're seeing them as they were about 13 billion years ago. They may no longer exist, but the light from them is just arriving to me. Here is a sketch of one of those galaxies looking from the pole on to the galaxy. We see it has a nucleus and these beautiful spiral arms, but if we look at that same galaxy edge on, not down from the pole, this is what we see. It's a very flattened system. It's 100 times longer than it is thick. The sun sits out at about two-thirds of the distance from the center of that galaxy. Of course, it measures 100,000 light years across. One of us. Well, let's look at a piece, just a little piece of the tabletop of our galaxy. And here is a sample of it. It's magnificent. There's so many stars here that it looks like a big cloud. We cannot resolve the stars there. But what I'm interested in for purposes of the fertile universe are these dark areas here. Let's look at one of them in a little more detail. So this is even more detailed than the previous. It's called the North American Nebula for very good reasons, right? I mean, there's the East Coast. Okay, there's the Gulf of Mexico. Here's the Yucatan Peninsula. 
there's uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, how do they go? I forget, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, I guess. And there's Florida. It's a little fogged over, but it has been since the elections of 2000. <laughs> <laughs> I won't talk any more politics, but we're not, getting, we're not getting a lot better. Within that dark material, this is what is happening. When we penetrate that dark material, this is in the Orion Nebula. Let's blow that up. And you may look at this and say, boy, that's pretty. Look at all those nice colors. A scientist looks and says, what does it mean? And you know what it means. Why is the blue gas more or less over here and the red gas over here? Because the red gas reveals a stellar wound where the newest, most massive energetic stars have been born in that gas. They're radiating the hydrogen gas. It's absorbing that energy and re-radiating it in the red region of the spectrum. Whereas this gas is blue because it's too far from the star forming region. So it's reflecting the light, not absorbing it. Like the sky is blue today, at least for the time being because sunlight is being scattered off the particles in the gas of the Earth's atmosphere the same way that the particles in this gas are scattering the light. What I'm saying is we can use this analysis to identify where stars are being born. And here is a fine picture of where stars are being born. How are stars born? A piece of that gas begins to break up into little pieces. I mean, this piece here may be four or five times the mass of the sun. And as that gas collapses by the law of gravity, it's no miracle. That's the way gravity works. It drags in until this gas collapses. As it collapses, it heats up. That's what gas does. As it expands, it cools down. As it collapses, it heats up. Okay, that's why I'm full of hot gas. <laughs> As it collapses, it heats up until you reach about 10 to 15 million degrees. And what that high temperature does is it turns on the thermonuclear furnace. Now, don't get scared off. That's a big word. All it means is that at that high temperature, okay, Hydrogen is being converted into helium, eventually helium into carbon, carbon into oxygen, nitrogen, and each time there's a conversion of a hydrogen atom to a helium atom, energy is released. That's the way it works. And so the sun, for five billion years, has been converting hydrogen to helium and shining. After a while, it will have depleted its hydrogen. It will collapse again to raise the temperature even higher to convert helium to carbon. And it will do that for a few hundreds of millions of years. Finally, the sun will die. Because when it collapses a final time, it can't raise the temperature high enough to get the next highest element in the periodic table. So every star is doing this. Some very massive stars, some less massive stars. The sun is a medium-sized star. It's been around for four and a half to five billion years, and it has about five billion more years. When the sun goes, even a little bit before it goes, we go, of course. But there's time left, folks, don't get <laughs> Plenty of time for <coughs> we Catholics to get the confession and all that stuff. <laughs> At any rate, stars are born in that way. Okay. And here is a fine example of a cloud breaking up to form a whole family of stars. We're going to get about 100 stars out of this. But stars also die. This is a dead or dying star. It's what will happen to the sun. It becomes a white dwarf, has no more energy, and it throws off its outer atmosphere to the universe. <coughs> But stars die in other ways. This is a stellar death in a chaotic, this is a nice peaceful smoke ring out to the universe. 
whereas a very massive star will die in this chaotic death. But the point is, whether it dies peacefully or chaotically, it throws out this matter to the universe until that matter gets spread out. And from this matter, left over from the death of a star, a new generation of stars are born. But notice what's happening. As the universe gets on, we're getting more and more of the heavier elements. Every time a generation of stars die, we get some helium, we get some carbon, etc. The sun is a third generation star. And if it were not, you and I wouldn't be here. You know, that's not romance, that's science. There were, until we had a third generation, we did not have enough carbon, nitrogen, etc., to make an amoeba or a toenail or a piece of hair for those who had it. We did not have the ingredients for life until we had this regeneration through three generations of stars. That's the way the universe works. Well, that's why the universe is fertile. There are 10,000 billion, billion stars dying, being born, dying, being born. And every time that happens, the universe is filled with more and more chemistry for life. So that's what I mean. The universe is a big soup with all the ingredients to make life because stars have generated those ingredients. We are born of stardust. It's literally true. I have a fellow professor at the University of Arizona who tells his students they're born of thermonuclear waste. Well, <laughs> it's the same thing, but you kind of smile when I say star. It's the same reality. Well, at least around one star, and we now know about many others, a planetary system formed, not by any miracle, but according to the basic laws of physics, until we got a planetary system with this little grain of sand as one of the eight planets around one of these 10,000 billion billion stars. That's what the Earth is. I mean, I can say a grain of sand, can't I? They're a precious grain of sand, but it's one of eight planets around one star or 200 billion stars in our galaxy of all these galaxies in the universe, but it's very precious. And one of the reasons it's particularly precious, at least to me, is that through modern science, we develop the ability to put the universe in our heads. Science is amazing. From the time of Galileo on, we develop that capability. So the universe is no longer in blind expansion. In us, if not in others, I don't know. In us, the universe is thinking about itself. So when I, as a scientist, I can measure the mass of this galaxy, I can measure how fast it's rotating, how many young stars are in there, how many older stars are in there. Absolutely amazing. There is a picture, an actual photograph of the tabletop of our galaxy. Just a flashback. It was taken over our observatory in Arizona. There's Phoenix and Tucson, the only city lights that we have. Look at that beautiful stretch. And we looked at that already in some detail with sketches and photographs. This age of the universe kind of, it tickles us to think the universe is 14 billion years old, let's say. What does that mean? I mean, I'm only 126, <laughs> and I'm trying to rival Moses. I know I'm not the youngest in this room, but I'm also not the oldest. I bet, well, let's forget about our ages. The age of the universe, 14 billion years. Let's make out that the age of the universe is one year, one revolution of the Earth about the sun, to get some feeling for what's going on. Mathematicians do it all the time. They say, scale it down so you can understand it. So let's do that. Let's suppose that this 13.8 billion is one year. Well, of course, it all began on 1 January. <laughs> the Earth came to be a little after half a year. That's seven months. But very quickly, once the Earth formed, within a few weeks, 
first life began to appear. That itself raises all kinds of thinking. Does that mean that life is easy to make? Because it happened so soon after a planet like the Earth formed? Be careful. That question is, is leading, but since we don't know how life began, we don't know how it began, we know it began rather rapidly, we don't know how it began. So it's very difficult to address a question like that, but we're always asking it. Of course, the dinosaurs had the blessed fortune to be born on Christmas Day. <laughs> they, were, they were only around five days. Fascinating that first human beings came to be two minutes ago. Okay? Jesus Christ was born two seconds ago, and Galileo was born one second ago. Now you can think about this all you want and you know about different aspects of this. The thing I say to myself is be careful when you talk about the universe from what you know from science because you have been using modern science to study a universe that's a year old and you've been doing it for one second. So if we don't know everything and we don't, give us a little more time. There's lots we don't know about the universe. We scientists sometimes, like I'm doing with you now, I mean, we know the age of the universe, we know how many stars are in it. We know everything. Forget it. There's a lot more we don't know than we do know. But let's go on then. This is just to bring back to us the nature of the universe. As the universe got older, in billions of years, this should be 13.8, doesn't matter now. Distance is kind of larger. That's what we mean by the expanding universe. Okay. And various things happen. Okay. We got galaxies, and then we got stars. We got our solar system. First microscopic life forms. Why did it take two-thirds of the current age of the universe to make an amoeba? Well, we know one reason. It took three generations of stars to get the chemistry to make an amoeba. And three generations of stars is just about 12 billion years. Because generations of stars overlap, right? I mean, I'm talking to someone this morning at, back at the morning who's a great-grandmother. So there are four generations in her family living together. So that happens also to stars. So if you calculated a third generation star like the sun, it took about 12 billion years to come to be. What happened, however, between first microscopic life forms and us? Well, I have to go quickly over this because I don't know much about it. <laughs> no, I'd like to share with you um, one simple little fact we do know, when you measure the size of something, R, how big, and how much does it weigh, M, mass, you get this distribution. So, you know, I am 5 foot 10, and at least before lunch I weigh 158, <laughs> so put me on there. Put all living things on there and everything on there, and you see this amazing relationship. There's nothing over here and nothing over there. Does this mean that we came out of the universe like everything else did? Well, that's stepping out a little too far. But it sure makes me curious. It sure makes me curious as to why we have this relationship. And the curiosity is best solved scientific explanation. The best scientific explanation is by what we call Neo-Darwinian evolution. The generation of ever more complex chemistry in the universe until we got the development of species through adaptations to our environment and changes in organism until we got to the human brain. How did this happened. That's how it happened. <laughs> now, I don't know. I don't know enough chemistry to even identify these unless they put words on them. Okay? 
But if you can see well enough, you'll notice that C, H, N, and O repeat themselves time and time and time again but in ever more complex molecules. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and the other carbon and oxygen. C and whatever it is. Hydrogen. How could I forget poor hydrogen? In ever more complex molecules. Well, now I'm asking you to do the following. Take this process of building up ever more complex chemistry in a fertile universe, as we've described it, and give it 14 billion years, or 12 billion, if you want. And what are you going to get? You're going to get ever more complex molecules if you let this process go on, until you get the human brain. That's the way chemistry works in a fertile universe. Now, if you'll accept that, because that can be argued, these are just, you know, the DNA. Darwin didn't know this, but we do. This is the beginning of evolution. These spirals separate. There are trillions of them. Some of them link back up with spirals from other twins, etc. And whenever they link up, they link up exactly correctly. A, T, C, G, A occur always in the same place, except once in a while they make a mistake. And that's what we call genetic mutation. This AT could wind up here where CG is, and CD down there. That's a genetic mutation. And it's happening all the time. And biologists tell me that 95% of genetic mutations don't do anything observable. We don't even know what's going on. but those that do change an organism do it from our point of view for good or for bad. We get leukemia and we get a change in an organism where the organism has to adapt to its environment and we get a new species until we get the human brain. Without these mutations we wouldn't have this chemistry building up to ever more complex organisms. <coughs> I'm going to, well, no, let's, let's, because somebody inevitably is going to say to me, this evolution is just a theory. Because in American English, when we say theory, we typically mean just a theory. Like, you know, I was in the shower, and I get out, and I'm telling down, I look out the window, and I see these frogs jumping. And I say, goodness, I was watching the Summer Olympics the other day, and I saw these guys and gals jumping these hurdles. We came from frogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do better than that. And this is only one piece of scientific evidence that we try to explain. Namely, each one of these creatures has the same chemical protein, cytochrome C for chemistry, identical same molecule. But that molecule has gone through mutations over time. And the number of mutations is this, 28.1 here, 20, etc. And to count up the number of mutations to any creature here, you have to go up and down these branches. So it's clear, isn't it, that the more complicated organism went through the most mutations in one and the same molecule. Explain it. The best explanation we have is that those mutations were precisely what led to the changes in the organism over time. It was a very slow process. But you said you were lucky. You got the right protein. This has been done with thousands of proteins with the same result. So you have to explain it. And the best explanation is scientific evolution. There are all kinds of other evidence from paleontology, geology, etc. But this is from molecular biology. <coughs> what did I say about chance? Well, up until now, not much. But if you think of this fertile universe, what is happening in this fertile universe? Well, first of all, 
in the beginning, two hydrogen atoms meet. They have to make a hydrogen molecule. That's the nature of chemistry. Okay? But they don't at this time and place because it has requires a certain pressure and temperature condition for them to unite into a molecule. So they don't. They wander throughout the universe. There are trillions of atoms doing this. They meet every so often. Well, what's the probability that when they meet, the pressure and temperature conditions will be right so that they make a molecule, a hydrogen molecule? Now, it's not zero, but it's not 100%. It's someplace in between, and that's what I mean by chance. There's a probability that two atoms of hydrogen will make a molecule. Now, we can calculate that probability around some stars. It's higher because the temperature and pressure conditions are different. <coughs> so this is not just hand waving. We can do statistical calculations on it. So we get a hydrogen molecule, okay? Two hydrogens, meat and oxygen. They have to make water but they don't at this time and place. This is what I mean by chance. We're building up ever more complex okay, chemistry by chance, but also by necessity. Chemistry requires certain things to happen. If the conditions are correct, it happens. And that's why I mean by the dance of chance and destiny or <coughs> chance and necessity in a fertile universe. When you put all three together, you get what we see. Here is a tree of the universe to wind up. Not a tree of life, a tree of the universe. Everything that ever happened in the universe is on this tree. Even those processes that never succeeded. Even those hydrogen atoms or hydrogen molecules that never built up. So there are lots of dead leaves and branches on this tree. Blow a quiet breeze through this tree, and what will you see? That's what you'll see. You will inevitably see something like this. Why? That's the way chemistry works. It builds up ever more complex molecules and organisms in this way. Why are human beings at the top? because we don't know what else to put at the top. <laughs> the human brain is the most complicated mechanism we know. I'm talking very materialistic, right? I said inevitably something like this. And those two phrases are important. I didn't say necessarily. Because if I did, I'd contradict everything I just said <coughs> about chance. And while there have been more, one, more than one occasion I've contradicted myself. My students let me know. I prefer not to do that. So inevitable. That is, chemistry works this way. And something like Because at certain epochs in this process, chance could have won out over necessity. And we could have arms that come off our belly buttons and our backs. And it would look strange, but we all look that way, so it wouldn't look strange. There could be some slight differences, but something like this, because that's the way chemistry works. The tree of life is really not a tree. I showed it here for a simple argument that I wanted to make, but in reality, it's a bush. Here's the beginning of life. It branches off into these three essential kingdoms. And we are up here in the corner here, among the animals. So, let's get back to the question. Chance or necessity? Or you now know, it's both in a fertile universe, right? So what are we going to do with the God question? Because the God question was based on the fact it's either chance or necessity. So did God do it? Let me flash back, even here, but certainly if you look at it this way, it looks like somebody planned all this. There seems to be a directionality to it all. Do I have any evidence to say that God did it? I don't know. 
as a scientist, there's no way I can know. If God is God, God is beyond, okay, our pursuit of knowing. God cannot simply be known. I can't prove that God exists. You know, I'll really get in the pulpit if I carry on. <laughs> God gave himself to me. God loved me. And that's the beginning. And after I sort of accept that and try and love God back, then I can begin to think about God. But God is not a source of explanation, primarily. God is a source of love. So let me know, try and get back to I can't know from science. There's no way I can know. If I say God doesn't exist from science, it's not science. If I say God does exist from science, it's not science. Now, there are any number of scientists who do this, but they're not doing science. They're ideologues who are you know, preaching their own way of seeing things and not just doing science. So I don't know. But if I believe that God created this universe I'm examining, and I do, despite the fact that I'm a Jesuit priest, I still am a religious believer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if I believe that God created the universe, isn't it valid for me as a scientist to say, look, I know what the universe is like, at least partially, from my science. So why don't I ask the question, what kind of God would make a universe like the one I know as a scientist. And of course, it's a magnificent God. God did not make a cereal box, a washing machine, a car, certainly not a Toyota, or nowadays it's GMC. Well, let me not try it. God did not make a prefabricated, a predetermined universe. The universe is dynamic. This dance is going on, and the future is not completely predetermined. Now, that raises a lot of theological questions, but I dumped those over on the theologians. Can God know? Could God know in the first billion years of the universe that I was going to come to be? Well, it's a little difficult to answer that from science, because it's not all predetermined. The point I'm saying is God made a universe that participates in the very creativity of God. The universe has a dynamism to it. It's not all prepackaged through evolution and through the expanded universe. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of accept that, then here are some questions that could arise for dialogue. I've said this. Science as such does not talk about God. But if I believe in God, the universe, etc., tells me about God. Don't tell me, Richard Dawkins, that I can't use my science to try and understand my faith. You may not want to, but I can, and I can share it with others. God is not an engineer who designed the universe. Because if he is, he did a damn poor job. <laughs> Hurricanes, tornadoes, leukemia. The eye is a magnificent piece of humanity, right? But all the defects we have. And besides, I'd like a 360-degree uh, vision so I could see the pretty girls coming up behind me. I just <laughs> want to oh, shut up, George. <laughs> if I were to use an image of God from what I know about God's universe, I would take God as a loving parent. You know, you parent it. You know, little kid, you have to tell a kid how to tie your shoestrings, how to say yes, man, how to blow your nose. But as a child grows up, there comes a time you have to let be. Let this child begin to make its own decisions with your help, as a parent, etc. But you have to let be. And I see God with respect to the universe as the universe as his child. Laws of chemistry, there's a certain structure to the universe, but it's not all predetermined. So be it. Thank you for listening. And uh, are there any questions? <laughs> Children, 
bonding you have with the clergy, the bonding. I look at it as, as a very important element in life. <coughs> I need to hear the level of the desire that your heads are at with this. And then I got one more question for you, Bob. Um, okay. Where do you see Lemoyne being a part of these three ways or tracks or paths of life? And other higher education schools are other higher education schools immersed in laying out what we've heard today and being able to absorb it and want it. Oh, I can't speak for all those schools. Depends, depends on the individual school. Certainly, the Moines is, is, you know, is, they haven't thrown you out yet. <laughs> they must have a reason that they say, when, they, when you said, I'll come, and then you said, what's going to be the curriculum? And you, you and them and the provost sat down and chatted this thing through and said, this is what we're going to have. And then maybe some Lewis's will ask you to come and speak to their different segments in the community so we get an understanding of what Lemoyne is and of what uh, Father Coyne's th thoughts and thinking are. Is there anybody who wants to ask any questions? We go on home and have lunch. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> 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 <laughs>